So many good things come from the waters. In the year 1491, the coastlines of North and South America were home to many people, as well as the vast land in between. On the Gulf Coast in Mesoamerica, the ancient Olmec left huge figures from centuries earlier. By 1491, the mother culture, as they're known, had passed, evolved into the Maya, most researchers think. This was only one coast to nurture new cultures. With their abundance of life, the coastal areas sustained societies that stratified into various classes of citizens. In some areas, people grouped themselves into clans, extended family groups that honored certain animals. In Mesoamerica, the Maya spread inland and built a society that endured for centuries. By 1491, the classic Maya culture had declined with many great cities abandoned by the people, leaving great stone structures in their wake. The city we call Palenque was built in the late Classic period. While the spirit of earlier culture remained, the rulers of Palenque put their own mark on this later society, made possible by the collapse of Tikal. The Maya were once believed to be peaceful astronomers, but Palenque shows another side of this culture. Here in this courtyard, we see the trophies, pieces of monuments to rulers of rival Mayan cities, overthrown by Palenque's warriors. Palenque supplied enough samples of Mayan writing to help researchers crack the code, deciphering the Mayan writing. Mayan history is well recorded at Palenque, including the crowning of the great leader Pakal by his father. Palenque fell, as did other Mayan cities. Too many trees were cleared for farmland, aggravating severe drought. All the prayers to Chakmol, the rain god, and all the human sacrifices to it did not stop the ecological collapse. New cities emerged and warrior societies became strong, but much of the Mayan glory was reclaimed by the forest, like this once towering pyramid at Tikal. In central Mexico, the new power was the Aztec Empire, building their capital city of Tenochtitlan. By 1491, the Aztec Empire exercised power over most of Mesoamerica. In western South America, the expansive Inca Empire sprawled along the Pacific Ocean. In 1491, power was concentrated in the hands of Tupac Inca, and the future looked promising for this well-organized society. Further north along the Pacific coast, the ocean's bounty allowed Native Americans in the northwest to thrive. The land bridge from Asia had long since flooded by 1491. That crossing was so long ago that it passed from collective memory. Along the coast in southeast Alaska, tribes like the Tlingit, the Haida, and the Simshian had established wealthy, stratified societies. With so much life teeming all around them, People on the northwest coast found their needs met by this generous ocean, freeing them to create elaborate totem poles and to put on potlatch events that went on for days. For those with skills and courage, it was a good life. Further south along the Pacific coast, tribes were numerous and distinct from each other. 
Many of these tiny territories had stratified societies, just like their neighbors up north. The languages were also distinct, one group's tongue unintelligible to its neighbors. While not as large in population, nor as wealthy as the people further north, the coastal Indians in the Pacific Northwest enjoyed natural riches and animal life. From Alaska to California, good things came from the ocean. Life was different for Native Americans living inland. In the Columbia River Basin, the lifeblood was salmon. Salmon swim upriver in their spawning migration. Then they die to bring nutrients back to the forest. The salmon, the river, and the mountain we call Mount Hood, all are sacred to the people of the plateau. Celilo Falls was part of the river where massive amounts of salmon were harvested, yet it was much more than that, according to Pat McMillan, curator of the Fable Museum in Klamath Falls. And so that was an area where they, you know, fished easily, basically, because they could uh, catch the fish right off the rocks. And um, so they were, that was just an amazing sort of thing. Another thing I thought was interesting about all of them is that if you were ill and you were sick or incapacitated in some way, you were always taken care of. That they always caught fish for all of the people in the tribe. And um, it didn't really matter to them. In, in fact, along that area, we just mentioned the Long Narrows, it said that a fisherman could catch a ton of fish a day. Wow. <laughs> the Columbia River provided inspiration as well as sustenance in 1491, a gathering place for related tribes. Some even made their homes right on the banks in places of natural shelter. Also along the banks of the Columbia River, Indians built fishing platforms. They belonged to certain families and they were handed down over generations. Pat McMillan explains. If your grandmother or grandfather had a spot, it was passed down to you or your family, however. Mm -hmm. But they also were very generous. I've, I've read that also, where they would be like um, a, a loan if someone came into the area without tribal affiliation. Uh, they would loan those. It would be like a cabin, I suppose, in the summertime if you had it and loaned it to your friends. But they, they, were, not, they were not selfish people. The Klamath Indians attended these gatherings and would have passed the sacred mountain we call Mount Jefferson on their journey home. The Klamaths had their own sacred mountain in their territory. This is what Mount Mazama looked like in 1491. The Klamath people still have the mountain's great eruption in their collective memory. The eruption was a result of an epic battle between gods, Mazama being the most changed from that conflict. Oh, and there was a beautiful maiden and romance involved. The victor in that great battle was Mount Shasta, even in 1491, Mount Shasta still had some eruptions in its future. In a world where everything was alive in spirit, the bear was an important figure in the mythology of people who lived within view of this great mountain. Storyteller Tom Doty explains. Bear is very important. We often refer to him as great bear in the sky, and bear in our mythology is in control of the seasons. Uh, we see bear as the Big Dipper constellation, also means, you know, Ursa Major, Big Bear, right? Yeah. 
And, and that constellation circles counterclockwise to the night around the North Star. Well, that's Bear dancing around the fire in his lodge. And as he's dancing around that fire, he is sending the seasons circling through the year. So that when we do our dances down here on the earth, our circle dances, we always dance counterclockwise here locally to honor the great bear in the sky and to help keep the seasons moving through the year. And, and you're mentioning about there always being animal people you know, in the stories. There's a reason for that. The animals in the stories not only have certain characteristics of the animals themselves, so we all, you know, coyote is, 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 is the obvious one, you know, yeah. and so and bear has kind of this slow moving, kind of lumbering kind of way of moving in the stories, even though he's kind of slow speaking, he's very smart and he can move very fast when he wants to. All of the characteristics, the animal characteristics are in the characters and the myths, but there's also human characteristics in each of these animals. And that's how we're, we can relate to them as human beings in that they're also out there doing stuff that people do, that human people do as well. Yeah. Now, uh, one of the things in, in our region, uh, not long ago, uh, a new casino opened up in Wairika, and it's called the Rain Rock. <laughs> I had no idea what a Rain Rock was, right. but actually that is very important, uh, the Rain Rock. The Rain Rocks are, and, and they're also connected to the bear mythology. The Rain Rocks are, are rocks scattered around the region, both Southern Oregon, Northern California. They often have cupules or these, these, these holes that are, that are, that are in them. And the bear clan of each of the local tribes or villages were basically in charge of the rain rocks. And the rain rocks were used to control weather. So you would, you would cover up the rock to, to stop the rain. You would uncover it to bring rain. There was also things about wind. They're very, fairly complicated sorts of things. But almost all of the, the rain rocks have bear paws carved on them because the, the weather and the seasonal changes are so closely associated with Great Bear in the sky. And then you also have this rock uh, just called the Bear Rock mm -hmm. that's uh, apparently uh, close to or on one of the table rocks? Yeah, yeah, lower table rock. It's, uh, it's near the summit of, uh, at one point as you go up the, the BLM trail up, up Lower Table Rock, there's a, there's a point toward the top that it's joined by the Old Time Indian Trail, and they're actually the same trail. And so as you come up to the summit of the rock, um, you see this, this bare rock in the middle of the trail. And, um, and so in a, as the seasons would change through the year, we would climb up that rock, up Lower Table Rock, and we would pass the bear rock and we'd, we'd pat bear on his nose lightly, not to wake him up, you know, if it was that time of year, and thank him for the seasons. And then a ceremony would be done on top, a bear dance, always circling counterclockwise. And so the bear rock is a physical representation there on Lower Table Rock in the center of our universe. Mount Shasta was named for the people who lived in this area. The Shasta Indians also had some presence in southern Oregon. Mount Shasta also had importance to other tribes, including the Pitt River Indians. The English name for these people came from the style of house they constructed. People in the arid southwest built houses of similar design. Then some built houses into cliffs. This is what they would have looked like in 1491 as the Anasazi had already abandoned dwellings like Mesa Verde. Unrelenting drought drove them to set up new communities along the Rio Grande River, a dependable, though narrow, source of water. Thus evolved the Pueblo culture, noted for its high development of pottery making. The Pueblo people endure to this day, though some of the river settlements were abandoned like those at Frijoles Canyon. In 1491, we also saw the Diné people established in the southwest. We know them as the Navajo. These speakers of the Athapascan language family are believed to have arrived in America in a third and much later wave of migration from Asia. As with the related Apache, the Diné had been established far to the north in the subarctic region. 
For reasons unknown, they undertook an epic migration southward, finally settling in the arid canyon country of the American Southwest. According to their own stories, the Navajo interacted with the Pueblo people, adopting many of the Pueblo ways, but rejecting living in cities. The family Hogan was their societal center. When the Navajo settled this land, they gave up their hunting ways from their long trek across the Great Plains. They became farmers. Above all else, the Navajo seek balance. Walking the path of beauty and peace is highly valued. The killing of an enemy upset the balance, and ceremonies had to be performed to restore health and balance. They were the blessed way. The great journey of the Navajo took them across the Great Plains and the Rocky Mountains. There they encountered other Indian tribes. These encounters were often violent. Some, like the Comanches and the Utes, remain enemies of the Navajo and Apache to this day. In 1491, the Great Plains region was characterized by ever-moving tribes because of its great size. A vital food source was bison, also nomadic, moving in great herds. All parts of the bison were used to sustain people in this region. Besides the food, the skin became material for blankets and the cured hide for teepees, the shelter that supported this nomadic lifestyle. People in the southeast were more sedentary. By 1491, the great earthen mound cities were mostly abandoned, indicating a decline in the farming-based Mississippian culture. The Cadoan culture continued as seen in the city of Spiro. Safely west of most Mississippian cities, the Cadoan cities missed the frequent warfare that ravaged Mississippian cities in the east. We'll learn more about that region in part two. Far to the east of the Mississippi River, in the current state of Georgia, earthen mounds bear witness to the extent in space and time of the Mississippian culture. The remains of the city at Akmolji testify to highly organized culture in the southeast. Today, Akmolji is a national monument. The mounds contain evidence of affluence and artistic mastery. The visitor center reproduces what a visitor may have seen centuries ago. Today's visitors are welcome to enter the Earth Lodge, where they can see the place of the sacred fire. Akmogi occupies a region near the people who became known as the Muscogee and later as the Creek. Some arrived in this region from other parts of the continent bringing with them the bones of their ancestors for burial in their new home. Further north, we find the Cherokee, people believed to have moved from the northeast woodlands speaking Iroquoian language. The hunter-gatherer way of life incorporated farming once they settled in their new home, much like the Navajo in the west. Corn production was well established in the region and the Cherokee fully embraced it. Growing corn was a sacred act performed by worthy women. To this day, the Cherokee performed the green corn ceremony, a ritual of the greatest importance. The children of the corn mother and the hunter were the hero twins. Thus the value of balance was instilled in the Cherokee from the earliest memory. Animals sacrificed themselves to feed and clothe the Cherokee, but only so long as they showed respect and maintained balance. Failure to do so could result in sickness or injury. Healing could be found in plants, but only if their gathering and preparation were done in the right way.
The Cherokee approach was not only to maintain balance, but to walk in beauty. One important ritual to the Cherokee was going to the water. A river or smaller stream was considered a living being, giving its blessing to all who immerse themselves in it in the morning. In 1491, the Cherokee were not a centralized government, rather a collection of four bands made up of seven clans each. The band was governed by notable elders, collectively known as the White Chief. Only in times of war did the Red Chief gain control, with younger members, including the beloved woman. Power returned to the White Chief when war ended. Harmony and consensus were always sought. If consensus could not be reached with the majority, the dissatisfied members left the community and formed their own in a different place. Once a year, each community would perform a ritual of forgiveness and renewal. All crimes except murder were capable of being forgiven. But those crimes had to be confessed to the sacred fire from which the heart could not be hidden. Fire was also considered a living being. All important ceremonies were held around the sacred fire. Led by the beloved man, Cherokee people danced and sang around the fire. Some songs were only to be sung in the fire's presence. The sacred fire remains the symbol of the Cherokee. Further north, southeast of Lake Ontario, five tribes had a history of constantly fighting each other. In this region live the Mohawk, the Onondaga, the Onega, the Cayuga, and the Seneca. All of them with small territories and all hostile to each other. De Kanawira sought guidance for a better way, and he was given a vision which he shared with all who would listen. He became known as the Great Peacemaker. His message was spread by Hiawatha, and the process of coming together was facilitated by a woman who became known as the Mother of Nations, and thus was born the Iroquois League. This changed everything. Raids on each other stopped. Conflicts were now settled by the Council of Fifty, where consensus was sought among the five tribes. The five rivals now joined hands as sister nations, forming a bond so strong that a falling tree could not break it. Systems were put in place to assure individual liberty and justice. Onondagas were appointed to be the keepers of the council fire. As the first among equals, the Onondagas called the others to council each year to discuss their differences and to keep peace among them. With war among themselves greatly diminished, the Iroquois League enjoyed greater success when fighting their Algonquian-speaking rivals. They became a major power in this region by 1491. They became known as the people of the Longhouse, the traditional structure housing extended families in a matrilineal society. Some Longhouses covered an area longer than a football field. Each of the five nations had territories laid out in great rectangles, much like the form of the Longhouse, each of them with access to the Hudson River on one end and Lake Ontario on the other. Choosing peace with each other instead of war, the Iroquois League prospered and set an example for others. Other groups of Native Americans lived in the Great Lakes region, the Huron, the Erie, the Kickapoo, and the Winnebago, the Fox and the Chippewa, all learned to thrive in their environment. All had complex relationships with their neighbors. Native Americans in the Northeast might look out over the great waters and wonder what good things would it bring to them. 
They would also have known that the sea brings great storms. Having survived so many over so many generations, they would have known the ways of survival. They may have looked to the sky for signs of trouble and challenge. Those signs would have told them nothing of the storm to come. Across those great waters, events they had no way of seeing would affect them in ways that none could imagine. Far beyond their view, in 1491, Christian armies on the Iberian Peninsula surrounded the walls of Granada, and an ambitious navigator from Genoa was planning a journey. <laughs>